Berlin. Uh, my father was a decorated World War I uh, officer, but he fought on the wrong side because he was fighting for the Kaiser. And uh, uh, we thought that uh, living in Berlin was perfectly fine, except that uh, we had some American relatives uh, who said, you've got to get out of this place because of our uh, Jewish background. And so we emigrated to the United States in 1937. Uh, I went to high school in, uh, outside of New York City in Scarsdale, New York, and then uh, went on to uh, college. Uh, I was interested in chemistry, and I decided I would major in chemistry in college, largely because I had a high school teacher who was teaching chemistry, and I thought that was very exciting. I was in college just about uh, three months or so when Pearl Harbor was bombed. And uh, that time, of course, uh, America tried to stay out of the war until this happened. And so uh, the question was, what do you do next? Uh, I was told that uh, the development of science was extremely important in the national interest, and I should, uh, by all means, finish my college education in chemistry which I did. I had got a bachelor's degree at Yale. As soon as I finished that, I was uh, uh, drafted and served in the uh, uh, infantry for basic training. When the army discovered that uh, because I had lived in Germany for some 12, 13 years, that uh, I spoke German. And they thought that uh, that might be of interest in the American war effort. Also the fact that I could use a typewriter, they thought was, was very significant. And so I was pulled out of the uh, uh, infantry and uh, was sent to a, uh, an ASTP program, Army Specialized Training Program, in uh, uh, Ohio State, in Columbus, Ohio, uh, where I was supposed to learn German in a couple of months, which is all right because I'd been speaking it for 12 years. And at that point, uh, uh, we started to get involved in German history and German philosophy. I was then transferred to a place called Camp Ritchie in, uh, southern, in northern Maryland. Camp Ritchie at that point <clears throat> was a major interrogation center and it dealt largely with uh, trying to extract as much information as possible from captured German soldiers. The emphasis at Camp Ritchie <clears throat> was to find out information about, of military significance. And for instance, the questions that we, were learned, that we learned to ask were, uh, who is your commanding officer? Uh, where is the local machine gun? And uh, to get very specific uh, war-related activities. Uh, to my great surprise, <clears throat> while everybody else was shipped overseas, I was told that I would be going to a place near Washington, D.C., where I had never been. That turned out to be 1142. And uh, at 1142, uh, because I had scientific training, mind you, a bachelor's degree in chemistry doesn't make you a super scientist, but the idea was that I should be able to interrogate those technically uh, proficient and expert uh, engineers and scientists who were captured by the American military in Germany and sent to this country for trying to get information that uh, might be useful in the war effort. All this was uh, around the beginning of 1945. As you remember, the war ended later in 45, but it was not at all sure exactly when that would be because with the Battle of the Bulge, which was a great surprise to, to the American military, uh, the uh, uh, war suddenly took a dangerous turn. And uh, it was only during the, during the early part of 45 that it was clear that uh, America was winning the war. It was an amazing experience. Uh, I was uh, put in a room to deal with some of the uh, captured Germans who had made some major contributions. And my job was to find out exactly what they had done and to report to the War Department, which uh, preceded the Pentagon, uh, that <clears throat> uh, of the information that is acquired in this way. And it was amazing because I interrogated somebody who had been working in purifying uranium. And I don't know, didn't know why anybody would want to purify uranium. 
you have to remember that this was at a time before the atomic bomb was released, and that information was totally secret, and there was really no knowledge at all about what atomic energy could do with respect to the war. So I was interrogating this, uh, this gentleman, and uh, he was very open because at that time, this was around uh, just before the, uh, war, the German uh, European war was uh, essentially over. But the people realized that uh, for the Germans there was no hope and that it was important for them to deal with Americans and the Allies because they didn't want to deal with the Russians, which was the other alternative. And so I was interrogating people about not only atomic energy, uh, as I say, which really did, hadn't been discovered yet. Uh, I was interrogating somebody else as to why it was that uh, the German planes, the new German planes, were so much faster than uh, our planes. And I'd never been in a plane because I thought that planes had propellers, but the Germans had uh, used jet engines to uh, power their, their aircraft. And this was a major change because here, all of a sudden, uh, the speed of the new airplanes was so much faster than what we had done. Uh, this was a fright could have been a very frightening experience because superiority of the air uh, was extremely important during World War II. Uh, we had acquired that because of our uh, extensive bombing efforts, but. Uh, there was now a, certainly a challenge that uh, the, we Americans might lose the superiority of the air over Europe uh, because of the fact that these planes were so fast we couldn't shoot them down. Uh, one of the other activities <clears throat> was to deal with the fact that the Germans had developed an extensive rocket program and they were sending rockets over London uh, as to to bomb uh, London extensively, and one of the the person who was the leader and instigator of this program was Werner von Braun. I, he was one of the people that uh, we interrogated. Uh, he then, uh, because of his expertise, was told that he and his family would be able to work in the United States. He was sent to a place in Texas. And uh, he was one of the people, if not the most important person, to develop the rocket that eventually landed American people on the moon. One, the person that I, I interviewed about the atomic bomb project, except I didn't know what that was, uh, I should actually press it to, uh, mention that uh, while I was still in college, a lot of my colleagues, uh, fellow students, uh, were told that uh, they should uh, consider a position uh, to go to a place called Oak Ridge uh, and uh, work for a company called Kellogg. And I didn't know what that was. I couldn't find Oak Ridge on the map. And uh, Kellogg's, we knew, I knew, was a maker of cereal. And uh, so I didn't know why all these people were going to go down there. And I said, can I go too? And they said, no, because you're not an American citizen yet. But when I interrogated uh, this gentleman uh, who had been involved in the purification of uranium, I thought that would be the end of my experience in military intelligence because I went back, uh, got my degree in chemistry, and then came to uh, George Washington University as a, as a scientist, where I still am. But uh, <coughs> the, the uh, uh, opportunity that uh, I had uh, of, of uh, military intelligence was pr promptly came back to me when I attended a meeting in Paris, scientific meeting, uh, where a lot of scientists were interested in biochemistry, which was my field. And I sat, <coughs> saw there sitting a person who looked very familiar, and he looked at me, and he looked also, he realized that he had seen me before, and suddenly it occurred to both of us, and he, I heard him say to his wife, who was with him, my God, there is my former prison warden.